You're listening to Audiology. Support this channel by becoming a member and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. The Tea Party movement kicked off in 2009 within the Republican Party, leaning heavily towards fiscal conservatism. It started as a pushback against the policies of then-Democratic President Barack Obama and played a significant role in the Republicans winning 63 House seats in 2010, taking over the U.S. House of Representatives. The people involved in the movement advocated for lower taxes, a decrease in the national debt and federal budget deficit by cutting down on government spending. They stood for the principles of a smaller government and strongly opposed the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, which was a flagship healthcare reform of President Obama. The movement was a blend of libertarian right-wing populist and conservative activism, and it stirred quite a bit of action, including protests and backing various political candidates since its onset. There has been debate over whether the Tea Party was a genuine grassroots uprising or an astroturf movement, which means it looked grassroots, but was actually orchestrated by powerful behind-the-scenes interests. About 10% of Americans identified with the movement in 2013, as stated by the American Enterprise Institute. And its name? That was inspired by the 1773 Boston Tea Party, a pivotal moment in the American Revolution, with some followers even donning Revolutionary War-era outfits to make their point. The call that really got the ball rolling was made by CNBC's Rick Santelli in February 2009, when he suggested a tea party while he was on air at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. The very next day, the nationwide Tea Party coalition set things in motion with a conference call that attracted around 50 conservative activists. This movement significantly influenced the internal dynamics of the Republican Party, though it wasn't a political party in the strictest sense. By 2016, research suggested that Tea Party caucus members voted in Congress, akin to a right-leaning third party. One of the key forces behind the movement was Americans for Prosperity, AFP, led by David Koch, a notable businessman and political activist. By 2016, Politico observed that the Tea Party movement had lost its steam, partly because its core ideas had been integrated into the wider Republican Party. In 2019, CNBC noted that the conservative wing of the Republican Party had essentially moved on from the Tea Party label. The Tea Party movement is all about shrinking the government's size and influence. It champions a free market economy with minimal government intervention. The movement aims to reduce the federal government's size, lower government spending, decrease the national debt and oppose tax increases. Tea Party groups have opposed various government initiatives and reforms, including the Troubled Asset Relief Program, President Obama's stimulus package, environmental cap and trade regulations, and health care reforms like the Affordable Care Act, famously nicknamed Obamacare. They have also protested against what they perceive as federal overreach on their constitutional rights, supported laws that enhance job flexibility without union constraints, and advocated for stricter border controls while opposing amnesty for undocumented immigrants. Following losses in the 2012 elections, they have attempted to block the health care law at the state level and opposed global initiatives such as the United Nations Agenda 21. They have contested the Internal Revenue Service's treatment of Tea Party groups and utilized super-political action committees to support candidates who align with their views, sometimes conflicting with mainstream Republicans. What makes the Tea Party unique is its decentralized nature. There is no central authority allowing local groups to pursue their own objectives. This diversity is regarded by many within the movement as a strength, protecting them from external influence and internal corruption. Despite the variety of priorities, a commonality exists in their particular reverence for the Constitution, which is considered crucial to their vision of government reform. However, their advocacy for the Constitution often reflects broader cultural values, more than a strict adherence to the document itself, with some members advocating for changes or the repeal of amendments related to taxation and senatorial elections. They have also supported amendments allowing state powers to repeal federal laws and enforcing a balanced budget. On social issues, the Tea Party tries to maintain a low profile, preferring to concentrate on economic matters and the principle of limited government. However, certain factions within the movement do engage with issues such as abortion, gun rights, school prayer, and immigration policy. The Contract from America is one significant initiative to codify the movement's objectives, led by conservative activist Ryan Hecker and supported by figures like Dick Armey of FreedomWorks, 
This agenda, derived from thousands of suggestions, outlines 10 primary objectives, but did not achieve widespread acceptance among Republican Party leaders who put forward their own proposals. After the 2012 elections, some Tea Party activists have embraced more populist stances on issues like immigration reform and minimum wage increases diverging from conventional conservative positions. Walter Russell Mead, a historian and writer, took a close look at the foreign policy perspectives of the Tea Party movement in an essay for foreign affairs back in 2011. He pointed out that members of the Tea Party, or Jacksonian populists as he calls them, really believe in the idea that America is unique and has a special place in the world. However, they are pretty skeptical about America's ability to shape a world order based on liberal values. According to Meade, when push comes to shove, they are all for going all out in war to achieve total victory rather than engaging in smaller, targeted conflicts with limited objectives. Meade highlights two main strands within the Tea Party's approach to international affairs. One is represented by Ron Paul, a former congressman from Texas, who preferred to keep the US out of foreign fights whenever possible, echoing Thomas Jefferson's ideas. The other strand associated with Sarah Palin, the former governor of Alaska, agrees on avoiding unnecessary conflicts, but supports a much stronger stance to ensure America stays on top globally. Despite their differences, Meade notes both groups aren't fans of what is known as liberal internationalism. A really interesting fact is that some Republicans aligned with the Tea Party, like Michelle Bachman, Jeff Duncan, Connie Mack IV, Jeff Flake, Tim Scott, Joe Walsh, Alan West, and Jason Chaffetz, supported a move by Dennis Kukinich, a progressive congressman. They voted in favor of his resolution to pull U.S. military forces out of Libya. Over in the Senate, Tea Party supporters Jim DeMint, Mike Lee, and Michael Crapo voted to cut foreign aid going to Libya, Pakistan, and Egypt. This shows a general trend among Tea Party members in both the House and the Senate towards reducing foreign aid. Moreover, a significant number of key Tea Party figures, both inside and outside of Congress, were against getting the military involved in Syria. The Tea Party movement is essentially a collection of local and national groups each setting their own goals and agendas without any centralized leadership to guide them. It has been hailed as a prime example of grassroots political activism, though some argue that it is more an example of astroturfing, where corporate interests fund what appears to be spontaneous community action to further their own goals. Others believe that while the movement does have genuine grassroots origins, these have been significantly boosted by right-wing media and supported by wealthy backers. Despite not being an official national political party, most people involved with the Tea Party identify as Republicans and generally support Republican candidates. Some experts, like Gallup's Frank Newport, see the Tea Party not as a new political entity, but as a fresh label for traditional Republican ideas and candidates. A 2010 study by the Washington Post found that a major driver of support for the Tea Party was dissatisfaction with the mainstream leaders of the Republican Party, with 87% of local Tea Party organizers citing this frustration as a key reason for the movement's popularity. Key figures such as Sarah Palin, Dick Armey, Michelle Bachman, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz have found support among Tea Party activists. In July 2010, Michelle Bachman even initiated the Tea Party Congressional Caucus. However, this caucus has not been active since July 16, 2012. A Politico article highlighted the wariness among Tea Party activists toward the caucus, perceiving it as an attempt by the Republican Party to control the movement. Echoing this sentiment, Utah Congressman Jason Chaffetz declined to join the caucus, arguing that imposing structure and formality would undermine the Tea Party's natural, free-flowing essence and that any attempt by Washington to co-opt it would dilute its authenticity. Tax Day protests, which have referenced the Boston Tea Party since the 1990s or even earlier, saw a significant development in 1984. That year, David H. Koch and Charles G. Koch, leaders of Koch Industries, set up Citizens for a Sound Economy. This conservative group aimed to push for a smaller government, reduce taxes and fewer regulations. Ron Paul, a congressman, was brought on board as the organization's first chairman. The organization worked on behalf of policies that would benefit corporations, including those in the tobacco industry. By 2002, the organization had launched a Tea Party website at the World Wide Web .com. The site described the U.S. Tea Party as a nationwide ongoing online event, welcoming anyone who thought taxes were excessively high. 
and the tax code overly complex. However, the website didn't gain much traction initially. The following year, in 2003, Dick Army took over as the organization's chairman after leaving Congress. A pivotal change occurred in 2004 when Citizens for a Sound Economy divided into two entities, FreedomWorks, which would focus on advocacy, and the Americans for Prosperity Foundation. Dick Army led FreedomWorks while David Koch remained at the helm of the Americans for Prosperity Foundation. These two groups played crucial roles in the Tea Party movement, particularly from 2009 onwards. In fact, The Guardian highlighted Americans for Prosperity and FreedomWorks as possibly the most prominent partners in the Taxpayer March on Washington in September 2009, also known as the 912 Tea Party. This event marked a significant moment in the movement, showcasing the influence and reach of these organizations. Fox News commentator Juan Williams has noted that the Tea Party was established following Ron Paul's presidential campaign in 2008. Ron Paul himself has underscored December 16, 2007 as a crucial point. On this date, his supporters arranged a groundbreaking fundraising event on the anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. However, Paul observes that the movement's original principles shifted as additional individuals, including Republicans, became involved. Dave Weigel of Slate.com concurs, attributing the earliest Tea Party events to December 2007, initiated by Ron Paul's supporters well before President Obama assumed office. By 2009, the movement had expanded significantly. The Atlantic's Joshua Green does not recognize Ron Paul as the Tea Party's founder, but describes him as its intellectual godfather, recognizing the broad acceptance of Paul's concepts within the movement. Jane Mayer of The New Yorker has recorded the pivotal financial backing from the Koch brothers through entities like Americans for Prosperity. Moreover, a 2013 study in tobacco control connected the Tea Party to non-profit organizations funded by the tobacco industry and other corporate interests, referring to a 1971 memo by tobacco lawyer Lewis F. Powell, Jr. as a layout for augmenting corporate political influence. Al Gore commented on how the Tea Party, with its connections to market fundamentalists and the tobacco sector, adheres to Powell's scheme to prioritize corporate earnings over public health. At a Tea Party gathering in 2011, Sarah Palin attributed President Obama with igniting the movement, implying it was a reaction to his policies. Similarly, Charles Homans of the New York Times viewed the Tea Party as a reflex to the dilemmas encountered by the Republican Party during the George W. Bush era, marking a pivotal episode for the party. On January 24, 2009, Trevor Leach, who led the Young Americans for Liberty in New York State, organized what is known as the Binghamton Tea Party. This event was a stance against obesity taxes suggested by Governor David Patterson of New York and called for the government to practice more financial prudence. During the protest, participants poured soda into the Susquehanna River and some even wore Native American headdresses, mirroring the actions of 18th century colonists in Boston Harbor, who protested British taxes by dumping tea. The protest also articulated opposition to federal policies like the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 from the Bush era, and from Obama's time, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 and a health care reform bill. Kate Zernike of the New York Times notes that leaders in the Tea Party movement recognize Seattle blogger and conservative activist Kelly Carinda for organizing the very first Tea Party event in February 2009, even though the Tea Party name wasn't used then. Chris Good from The Atlantic and Martin Casty from NPR describe Carinda as a pioneering Tea Party organizer, highlighting her early Tea Party-style protests. Carinda first rallied people for what she called a porculous protest in Seattle on February 16th, just before President Obama signed the stimulus bill. She organized this protest on her own, without assistance from any official groups or city leaders, and was amazed to draw 120 participants in a very liberal city with just four days' notice, thanks to her tireless outreach efforts. Steve Barron, a blogger, helped promote Carinder's event and spoke at it. Carinder also reached out to Michelle Malkin, a conservative author and Fox News contributor, to spread the word on her blog. Malkin's efforts did not stop with Seattle. She also helped publicize a similar protest in Colorado the following day. Carinder did not stop there. She organized another protest on February 27, 2009, which drew more than double the attendance of her first rally. 
On February 18, 2009, just one month into its term, the Obama administration unveiled the Homeowners Affordability and Stability Plan. This economic strategy aimed to assist homeowners in avoiding foreclosure by offering mortgage refinancing options, a response to the financial downturn of the Great Recession. The very next day, CNBC's business news editor Rick Santelli openly criticized the plan during a live broadcast from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange floor. Santelli expressed his disapproval by stating that the plan was promoting bad behavior and subsidizing losers' mortgages. He even floated the idea of hosting a tea party for traders to dump derivatives into the Chicago River on July 1st, asking, President Obama, are you listening? as he got cheers from surrounding traders, much to the amusement of studio hosts. This outburst went viral, especially after being spotlighted on the Drudge Report. This specific broadcast is frequently pinpointed as a pivotal moment for the Tea Party movement, suggesting it helped spark the collective action under the Tea Party name. According to journalists Beth McGrath of The New Yorker and Kate Zernike of The New York Times, along with Lee Fang, it was Santelli's fiery speech that set the fuse to the modern anti-Obama Tea Party movement. Sparked by Santelli's words, a website named reteaparty.com was set up merely 10 hours later to organize Tea Party events for the 4th of July, attracting around 11,000 daily visitors by March 4th. In sync with this, the conservative group Americans for Prosperity hastened to register taxdayteaparty.com, advocating for protests against Obama, and other related websites like ChicagoTeaParty.com went live rapidly. Fox News soon picked up on the burgeoning Tea Party, with mentions of it the day following Santelli's broadcast. By February 20th, a Facebook page mobilizing for Tea Party protests nationwide was up and running. The momentum culminated in a nationwide Chicago Tea Party on February 27, 2009, with protests in over 40 cities, marking the first national protest of what would become a significant political movement. This movement garnered the backing of at least a dozen prominent figures and their organizations, with Fox News playing a significant promotional role in the protests dubbed FNC Tax Day Tea Parties throughout 2009. They even lined up speakers, including then-host Glenn Beck, whose participation was later discouraged by Fox for subsequent events. The Tea Party movement has consistently opposed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, often calling it Obamacare. Interestingly, this nickname was not only used by those against the law, but also embraced by many of its supporters, including President Obama himself. This opposition is part of the Tea Party's broader stance against government involvement, which also includes resisting gun control efforts and opposing increases in federal spending. From 2009 to 2014, Tea Party activists have concentrated their efforts on electing members of Congress who would vote to repeal the health care reform. According to the Kansas City Star, their goal was to get a repeal passed through both chambers of Congress and override any veto from President Obama. However, some conservative figures, like columnist Ramesh Ponuru, have critiqued this approach as being highly unrealistic. Ponuru pointed out that the likelihood of overturning a presidential veto is quite low, arguing that if a Republican-led government failed to repeal Obamacare by 2017, it would represent a significant political failure. Starting in the 2010 elections, groups related to the Tea Party movement began to emphasize not just rallying their members, but also getting out the vote and grassroots efforts to support candidates who backed their ideas. For the 2010 midterm elections, the New York Times pointed out 138 candidates for Congress who had substantial support from the Tea Party, all running as Republicans, 129 for the House and 9 for the Senate. A poll by the Wall Street Journal and NBC News in mid-October of that year showed that 35% of likely voters supported the Tea Party, with a whopping 84% of them favoring Republican candidates over Democrats by 84% to 10%. It's believed that the first Tea Party-affiliated candidate to win office was Dean Murray, a businessman from Long Island, who clinched a New York State Assembly seat in a special election in February 2010. Going by NBC blog statistics, Around 32% of candidates endorsed by the Tea Party, or identifying with it, won their elections in 2010. This included victories in 5 out of 10 Senate races, a 50% success rate, and 40 out of 130 House races, about 31%. In states like Colorado, Nevada, and Delaware, 
Tea Party-endorsed Republican nominees for the Senate overcame the party's more mainstream candidates in the primaries, although these victories didn't translate into general election wins against Democrats. The Tea Party's influence was a defining factor in the 2010 wave election, in which Republicans gained 63 House seats and took control of the House of Representatives. The Tea Party is closely tied to the Republican Party, often seen as its more conservative faction fighting against the party's moderate wing in primaries. Despite its significant impact within the Republican Party, Tea Party candidates had a tougher time in the 2012 elections, winning four out of 16 Senate races and losing about 20% of the House seats they had gained in 2010. Michelle Bachman, founder of the Tea Party Caucus, was re-elected to the House by a slim margin. Post-2012, the Kansas City Star in May 2014 noted that Tea Party candidates, often new to politics and sometimes lacking funds, were facing more traditional Republicans who prioritized winnability over ideology, especially after the setbacks in 2012. Some within the Republican Party explicitly adopted this strategy. In a notable 2014 upset, Dave Bratt, a Tea Party favorite, defeated incumbent GOP House Majority Leader Eric Cantor. Bratt, an economist and professor who championed fiscal conservatism and was inspired by Milton Friedman, won the seat comfortably until he lost his re-election in 2018. That year also saw Tim Scott become the first African-American U.S. Senator from the South since Reconstruction, winning a special election in South Carolina. In Texas, the 2014 elections saw significant wins for the Tea Party, with candidates like Dan Patrick and Ken Paxton securing high-profile offices. In the 2015 Kentucky gubernatorial election, Matt Bevin, a Tea Party favorite who previously challenged Mitch McConnell in a primary, was elected governor with over 52% of the vote. Despite concerns about his appeal, Bevin became only the second Republican governor of Kentucky in 44 years. In May 2013, reports by the Associated Press and the New York Times surfaced, revealing that during the 2012 election, the Internal Revenue Service was scrutinizing Tea Party groups and other conservative organizations applying for tax-exempt status. This scrutiny wasn't typical and sparked widespread criticism from the public and politicians, leading to several investigations. Some of the groups were asked to provide lists of their donors and answer questions about their family members and their activities on social media. This kind of request from the Internal Revenue Service usually goes against its own policies. Lois Lerner, who was in charge of the division handling tax-exempt groups at the Internal Revenue Service, publicly apologized, admitting, that was wrong, that was absolutely incorrect, insensitive and inappropriate. Despite these controversies, Douglas Shulman, the Internal Revenue Service Commissioner at the time, testified to Congress in March 2012, denying any biased targeting based on political beliefs. Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, a senior Republican on the Senate Finance Committee, found the apology lacking. He demanded strong assurances from the Internal Revenue Service that steps would be taken to prevent such inappropriate scrutiny from happening again, emphasizing the group's constitutional right to express their views. Despite an investigation by a Senate subcommittee that claimed to find no bias, a disagreement arose with Republican committee members submitting a contrasting report. According to the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, there was no evidence of political activity in 18% of the conservative groups singled out for additional Internal Revenue Service scrutiny because their names included terms like Tea Party. Michael Hiltzik in a Los Angeles Times piece noted that both conservative and liberal groups faced scrutiny as the Internal Revenue Service grappled with applying complex rules to nonprofits potentially engaged in political activities. Interestingly, of all the groups flagged, only one, a group preparing Democratic women for electoral challenges lost its tax-exempt status. After a thorough two-year investigation in October 2015, the Justice Department concluded there was no evidence of Internal Revenue Service officials acting with political bias or corrupt motives that would warrant criminal charges. Fast forward to October 2017, the Trump administration finalized a settlement for the case linchpins of Liberty v. United States. In this settlement, the Internal Revenue Service offered a heartfelt apology for wrongly singling out the plaintiff for intensive scrutiny based on the organization's name or political stance. The Internal Revenue Service acknowledged this was incorrect 
and offered apologies for the excessive delays and unnecessary information requests. That same month, it was reported by the Treasury Department's Inspector General that the Internal Revenue Service had also scrutinized liberal groups, including those with Progressive and Occupy in their names, showcasing a broader approach to flagging organizations for review. During his 2016 campaign, Donald Trump frequently expressed admiration for the Tea Party movement. At a Tea Party gathering in Nashville in August 2015, Trump shared his high regard for the movement, saying, The Tea Party people are incredible people. These are people who work hard and love the country, and they get beat up all the time by the media. In a CNN poll from January 2016, at the start of the Republican primary, Trump was the leading choice among those who identify with the Tea Party, securing 37% of their support, slightly ahead of Ted Cruz, who had 34%. Several analysts, including Jonathan Chait, Jenny Beth Martin, and Sarah Palin, have pointed out how crucial the Tea Party movement was in Donald Trump, securing the Republican nomination for president and ultimately winning the presidency. They believe Trump's victory represents the peak of the movement's influence and the widespread dissatisfaction with the political establishment it embodies. After Trump's election, Jenny Beth Martin remarked that with Trump's win, the values and principles that gave rise to the Tea Party movement in 2009 are finally gaining the top seat of power in the White House. However, not everyone shares this perspective. Some critics, such as conservative campaign finance lawyer Paul H. Jossie and Jim Geragty from the National Review, suggest that the Tea Party has either diminished significantly or completely disappeared. Jossie criticizes the movement for straying from its grassroots beginnings and becoming a tool for political action committees that exploited its supporters for financial gain, significantly draining its energy and resources. Tea Party activities saw a decrease starting in 2010, with Harvard's Theda Skokpol noting that the number of Tea Party chapters dropped from about 1,000 to 600 between 2009 and 2012. Despite this, Skokpol praised the survival rate as quite impressive. The Tea Party began focusing more on local issues and policy mechanics rather than on national protests, adjusting their approach to gain political influence. During the 2012 GOP presidential primaries, the Tea Party's involvement was relatively low due to internal divisions and a general lack of excitement for the candidates. However, the movement's influence within the Republican Party grew significantly, especially after Paul Ryan was chosen as Mitt Romney's vice presidential candidate. The New York Times highlighted that Tea Party lawmakers had moved from the fringes to the heart of the Republican Party. Despite its impact, the Tea Party faced criticism from within its own ranks, notably from then-Speaker of the House John Boehner during the 2013 U.S. debt ceiling crisis. Boehner accused Tea Party-linked politicians of losing all credibility by enforcing unrealistic positions within the party. A 2013 survey showed that 20% of Republicans identified with the Tea Party, which still organized significant events, such as a rally at the U.S. Capitol in 2014, marking its fifth anniversary. By 2016, Politico declared the Tea Party movement essentially completely dead, though it noted that many of its ideas had been integrated into the mainstream Republican Party. By 2019, the conservative segment of the party had moved away from the Tea Party label. Participants linked to the Tea Party movement were also identified among those involved in the January 6, 2021 United States Capitol attack. Dr. Jeffrey Caberservice in 2020 discussed how the Tea Party's deep-seated distrust of political norms was evident early on, notably through its promotion of birtherism, a baseless conspiracy theory targeting Obama. This skepticism towards established institutions and objective truth was compounded by social media's role in spreading such beliefs. Cabba Service argued that the Tea Party spirit lived on and found new expression in Donald Trump's campaign, which, like the Tea Party, thrived on unfounded conspiracy theories that accused Democrats and elites of undermining mainstream American values and interests. Several surveys have revealed insights into who typically supports the Tea Party movement. Although there are some variations in results, these surveys generally indicate that Tea Party supporters are more likely than the average American to be white, male, married, over the age of 45, regular attendees of religious services, conservative, and to have higher income and education levels. It's estimated that between 10% to 30% of Americans identify with the Tea Party movement. 
According to a poll by The Washington Post and ABC News, a majority of Republicans and about 20% of Democrats are in favor of the movement. The Atlantic has reported on the Tea Party movement, highlighting that it is considered an organic movement with guidance from three main groups, Freedom Works, Don't Go, and Americans for Prosperity. Tim Phillips, a prominent conservative political strategist and the leader of Americans for Prosperity, has commented that the disorganization within the Republican Party precludes it from orchestrating such a movement. The Christian Science Monitor has shared that Tea Party activists have faced strong criticism, with some calling them neo-Klansmen and hillbillies. However, this depiction contrasts with data suggesting that the movement is more mainstream and includes a significant number of women, debunking the myth of its supporters being solely angry white men. Juan Williams has noted that the Tea Party's opposition to health reform is more about self-interest than racism. Gallup conducted a poll in March 2010 which found that, aside from differences in gender, income and politics, self-described Tea Party members mirrored the general population in demographics. Forbes.com in 2014 likened the Tea Party's base to those who supported Ross Perot in the 1990s. Polls consistently show that Tea Party supporters are predominantly Republican, with favorable views of the Republican Party and unfavorable views of the Democratic Party. According to a Bloomberg National poll, 40% of Tea Party supporters are aged 55 or older, 79% are white, 61% are men, and 44% describe themselves as born-again Christians. This compares to 32%, 75%, 48.5%, and 34% of the general populace, respectively. Susan Page and Naomi Jagoda from USA. Today in 2010, described the Tea Party more as a state of frustration rather than a classic political movement, with its participants being older, married, and primarily white, though nearly a quarter come from other racial groups. They share a belief in a federal government that's too large and powerful. Surveys from the 2012 Republican primary voters in the South have shown that racial animosity isn't a driving force for Tea Party supporters, but there is a correlation with religious evangelicalism. Tea Party backers tend to be older, male, less wealthy, more ideologically conservative and more partisan compared to other Republicans. These characteristics align with a more racially conservative outlook within the party. However, when controlling for these factors statistically, Tea Party Republicans and other Republicans show hardly any difference in their views on racial issues. On the contrary, a study in 2015 found racial resentment to be a significant predictor for membership in the Tea Party movement. In an October 2010 survey conducted by the Washington Post with Tea Party organizers, a whopping 99% expressed that their worries about the economy played a significant role in their activism. Other surveys delved into the views of Tea Party supporters on hot-button issues. When asked about their thoughts on their own income tax fairness, a CBS-New York Times survey found that 52% of Tea Party supporters felt their taxes were fair, slightly lower than the 62% agreement seen across the broader population. Interestingly, a Bloomberg News poll revealed that Tea Party supporters might not always be against more government action. Pollster J. Ann Selzer observed, The ideas that find nearly universal agreement among Tea Party supporters are rather vague. You would think any idea that involves more government action would be anathema, and that is just not the case. Ahead of a new version of their book, American Grace, political scientists David E. Campbell and Robert D. Putnam shared in the New York Times their findings on Tea Party backers. They turned the common perception of Tea Party supporters as political novices on its head, showing them to be primarily ardent, politically engaged Republicans. Their research also suggested that Tea Party enthusiasts were just as affected by the 2007 to 2010 recession as the average person and were more interested in integrating religious values into government than in minimizing government size. The Tea Party's skepticism toward global warming was evident in the 2010 midterm elections. According to a New York Times slash CBS News poll, only a minor fraction of Tea Party followers see global warming as a serious issue, significantly lower than the general public's concern. The group also stands against regulations like emission trading legislation that aims to reduce carbon dioxide emissions as highlighted by their support for California Proposition 23. This proposition sought to pause a key global warming law, but was rejected by a majority of voters. 
Tea Party activists also lean towards stricter illegal immigration control. Polling indicates merely 7% approve of President Obama's performance, in stark contrast to 50% of the general populace as of April 2010, with about 77% having supported his rival John McCain in 2008. A University of Washington survey noted that 73% of Tea Party followers disapprove of Obama's approach to Muslim countries, 88% back Arizona's strict 2010 immigration law, and more than half believe immigration negatively affects U.S. culture. Moreover, 82% oppose legal marriage for gay and lesbian couples, and 52% believe these groups possess too much political influence relative to their population size. Sarah Palin played a central role in the Liberty at the Ballot Box bus tours, which aimed to gather financial support for Tea Party candidates. Throughout one of these tours, Palin visited 30 towns and journeyed across 3,000 miles. After the Tea Party caucus came into being, Michelle Bachman successfully raised $10 million for her political action committee, Michelle Pack, directing funds towards the campaigns of Sharon Angle, Christine O'Donnell, Rand Paul, and Marco Rubio. In a significant development in September 2010, the Tea Party Patriots disclosed receiving a generous donation of $1 million from an unidentified donor. Regarding the support of the Koch brothers, Jane Mayer, writing for The New Yorker on August 30, 2010, highlighted that David H. Koch, Charles G. Koch, and their company, Koch Industries, were said to have financially backed an organization that played a pivotal role in the emergence of the Tea Party movement through the auspices of Americans for Prosperity. The Americans for Prosperity spearheaded the hot air tour to oppose carbon taxes and the implementation of cap and trade programs. Addressing these claims, a spokesperson for Coke Industries clarified in 2010 that neither the Coke companies, the Coke foundations, nor Charles and David Coke individually had directly funded the Tea Party events. In a survey conducted by USA Today and Gallup back in March 2010, 28% of people said they backed the Tea Party movement, 26% didn't, and 46% didn't have a strong opinion either way. Those numbers stayed pretty much the same until January 2011. However, opinions started to shift by August 2011. Around January 2011, a different survey by the same groups found that nearly 70% of adults thought Republican leaders in Congress should listen to ideas from the Tea Party movement. This included about 90% of Republicans, but by August, 42% of voters said if a candidate was endorsed by the Tea Party, they would be less likely to support them. This sentiment was much less common among Republicans, at only 12%. In April 2010, a Gallup poll noted that 47% of Americans didn't see the Tea Party in a good light, whereas 33% did. A study by political scientists David E. Campbell and Robert D. Putnam in 2011 placed the Tea Party at the very bottom in terms of likability when compared to around two dozen other American groups, even less popular than Muslims and atheists. By November 2011, the New York Times reported that support for the Tea Party had dropped significantly, even in areas that were once strongholds. Pollster Andrew Kohut suggested that their position in Congress was seen as too unwilling to compromise and too extreme. A CBS News New York Times poll in September 2010 showed that only 19% of people supported the Tea Party, with 63% not in favor and 16% unsure. As for their image, 29% viewed them unfavorably, and 23% had a favorable view. A year later, those viewing it favorably slightly increased to 20%, but the unfavorable view jumped to 40%. According to a CNN ORC poll in late September 2011, the favorability rating was at 28%, while 53% viewed the Tea Party unfavorably. In a September 2010 NBC News Wall Street Journal poll, 27% said they were supporters of the Tea Party. When asked about its impact, 42% felt the Tea Party had a positive effect on the US political system, while 18% saw it as negative. Comparatively, 36% had a favorable view of the Tea Party, a tad higher than the favorable views for the Democratic Party, 37%, and the Republican Party, 31%. According to a March 2010 Quinnipiac University poll, 13% of adults nationwide identified with the Tea Party 
and the movement itself had a more positive than negative image, though nearly half of the respondents didn't know enough about it to have an opinion. A survey by the Winston Group in April 2010 reported 17% of American registered voters saw themselves as part of the Tea Party movement. After the 2011 debt ceiling crisis, opinions about the Tea Party became more critical. A Gallup poll showed that 28% of adults did not support the Tea Party, with 25% in favor, highlighting that the Tea Party's popularity seemed to decrease following the intense debate over the debt ceiling. This debate saw Tea Party Republicans strongly opposing any compromises on taxes and spending. Similarly, a Pew poll indicated that 29% of those surveyed believed Congressional Tea Party supporters had a negative impact, opposed to 22% who saw it as positive. This poll also found those who followed the debt ceiling discussions closely tended to view the Tea Party's impact more negatively than those who paid less attention. A CNN or C poll showed a 51% disapproval and 31% approval of the Tea Party. By 2012, a Rasmussen Reports poll found that 44% of likely U.S. voters had a somewhat favorable opinion of the Tea Party, but 49% viewed them unfavorably. Among Republicans, 53% thought the Tea Party would be beneficial in the 2012 elections. By 2013 and 2014, negative views of the Tea Party had increased nationally, but its core support remained stable, as reported by Forbes.com in February 2014. Rasmussen reports in October 2013 found an even split, 42%, in identification with the Tea Party and President Obama among respondents. However, 30% viewed the Tea Party favorably, while 50% did not. Furthermore, 34% thought the Tea Party was good for the country, against 43% who saw it as bad. On key national issues, the views of Democrats aligned more with Obama's, whereas a majority of Republicans and unaffiliated voters felt closer to the Tea Party. Polling data over these years continued to reflect partisan divides regarding the Tea Party. For instance, an October 2013 Pew Research Center poll showed 69% of Democrats viewing the Tea Party unfavorably compared to 49% of independents and 27% of Republicans. A CNN ORC poll from the same period found 28% of Americans favorable towards the Tea Party, while 56% were not. Vance AP GFK survey in January 2014 revealed that 27% of respondents identified as Tea Party supporters, in contrast to 67% who did not. During a town hall meeting in Arnold, Missouri, on April 29, 2009, President Obama addressed the Tea Party protests. He expressed openness to discussing ways to reduce health care costs and stabilize Social Security alongside Senator Claire McCaskill through a comprehensive review of federal spending. Obama emphasized that attributing the nation's financial issues solely to the Recovery Act was misleading, as it represented only a small portion of the wider problem. He advocated for a cautious approach to budget tightening, focusing on supporting working American families rather than cutting programs for ordinary people in favor of tax reductions for the wealthy, a strategy he stated had failed during the previous eight years. On April 15, 2010, Obama observed that over the last year, 25 different tax cuts had been passed, benefiting 95% of working Americans. He expressed surprise at the ongoing tax-related rallies, suggesting that participants should instead be grateful for these tax cuts. In a town hall hosted by CNBC on September 20, 2010, Obama discussed the value of healthy skepticism towards government spending. However, he challenged the Tea Party movement to articulate specific plans for reducing government debt and spending. Obama highlighted the inconsistency of calling for spending control, while also proposing $4 trillion in additional tax cuts without offering concrete solutions for balancing the budget. He urged the movement to specify which government programs they would cut, making clear the difficult choices involved in fiscal policy. The Tea Party movement combines elements of conservative, libertarian and populist ideals. It is interesting to note that the way people feel about the Tea Party often depends on their political affiliations, particularly within the major United States political parties. A study highlighted that 20% of Republicans see themselves as part of the Tea Party, which shows the movement's significant impact. Since its emergence in the late 2000s, the Tea Party has been active in organizing protests and backing political candidates. However, 
it has faced criticism from left-leaning groups, accusing it of racism and intolerance. These critics point to certain incidents as proof, although supporters argue these are just isolated cases not reflective of the movement's core values. There is also a lot of discussion about media bias, with accusations flying from both sides about whether the press is fair to the Tea Party. Moreover, when it comes to understanding public opinion through polls, there are questions about who is being surveyed and how to interpret the results when they come from different groups. Despite having some libertarian beliefs, most American libertarians do not align with the Tea Party, mainly due to its strong Christian right influence, which clashes with libertarians on several issues, including drug policy. For instance, a 2013 survey found that 61% of libertarians did not consider themselves part of the Tea Party, mainly because the movement also focuses on social issues like homosexuality, abortion and religion, which many libertarians would prefer to avoid, favoring discussions on limited government and states' rights instead. Ronald P. Formisano's book, The Tea Party, A Brief History, reviewed in 2012 by Publishers Weekly, offers a balanced view on the movement, clearing up some common misunderstandings. Formisano suggests that Tea Party supporters are not just extremists. Like many Americans, they want to take control of their futures. He also makes a connection between the Tea Party and prior backing for independent candidate Ross Perot, indicating a recurring theme in American politics of challenging the status quo to regain control over personal and national destiny. In the lead-up to the final vote on the health care bill, at least 10 Democratic lawmakers across the country faced vandalism and violent threats, putting the Tea Party movement in a difficult position. The New York Times highlighted a particularly alarming incident on March 22, 2010. Da Tea Party leader from Lynchburg, Virginia, along with the Tea Party chairman from Danville, Virginia, mistakenly posted what they thought was Congressman Tom Periello's home address on their websites. They invited people to drop by to show their displeasure about Periello's support for the health care bill. It turned out to be the address of Periello's brother. After detecting the smell of gas at his home, it was discovered that a gas line leading to a propane tank on his porch had been deliberately cut. This act of vandalism was taken very seriously by local police and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Moreover, Periello's brother received a letter threatening him over the health care legislation. Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli condemned the posting of the address as a dangerous tactic, far removed from civil discourse. In response, Tea Party leaders quickly condemned the violent acts and made it clear they did not support such behavior, stating it went against their principles. A few months later, in July 2010, the North Iowa Tea Party stirred up controversy by displaying a billboard that grouped pictures of Adolf Hitler, Barack Obama and Vladimir Lenin under the theme of change, suggesting a parallel between National Socialism, Democratic Socialism and Marxist Socialism. This billboard faced heavy criticism, including from fellow Tea Party activists. North Iowa Tea Party co-founder Bob Johnson admitted that their message against socialism might have been overshadowed by the controversial imagery. Following these reactions, the billboard was taken down on July 14th at the request of the North Iowa Tea Party. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.